Uh, good evening, everybody. You're very welcome to our webinar on uh, fertilizer planning for next spring. My name is Richard O'Brien. I'm regional manager for Walford and Kilkenny. And I suppose the main topic that we really want to talk about tonight is planning that fertilizer for spring and how to optimize the response from fertilizer and from slurry. Uh, we know the price of fertilizer is, is, is going to be quite high next year. So how do we optimize? What, are, what can we do today uh, or in the next couple of weeks to get a better response from slurry and fertilizer? And it's great. We have a great panel of speakers uh, this evening. We're joined by Enda McLaughlin, who is a dry stock, far, or dry stock advisor in the Mullinavat office. Uh, we have Pat Moylan, who is a dairy advisor in the Kilkenny office. And last but not least, we have Paul Bowden, who has joined us from Orlingford. He's a dairy farmer in Orlingford. So let's get kicked off. I think we have a, we have a very good attendance here this evening. Uh, I suppose it's, it's, it's a hot topic at the minute. And uh, just to make this as interactive as possible, there's a Q&A um, button at the end of your screen. So if you could put through any question, uh, we'll try and make it as interactive as possible. Any questions you have, put it into the Q&A and we'll go through those questions during the seminar. So this seminar should last for about 45 minutes. So Enda, we'll start with you on the practices around lime and uh, soy sampling now to make better decisions. Thanks, Archie. Yeah, so I'm just going to start off there. Richie commented on, I suppose, what we can do now in the next few weeks to maybe set ourselves up for next spring and kind of counteract these high fertilizer prices that have been quoted for spring of 2022. And really, I suppose, the first step we can look at and we need to focus on in the next few weeks and in early January is really going back to basics and, I suppose, getting a soil sample for the farm Um if you haven't already one there on the farm. So I suppose ideally, you know, looking at soil sampling, it's 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 very low cost compared to the high fertilizer price that are being quoted there. Um, so if you haven't set samples there for the farm taken in the last three or four years, now is an ideal time to go out and do it. But just in terms of sampling the farm, if you were going to commit to that, it's important that you, the information you receive is, is as accurate as possible. So the recommendation there would be to take a sample every two to four hectares, ideally. Um, sample as per crop type. So what I mean by that is that if you're taking a mixing a sample from different parcels, that you don't mix a sample of silage ground with a sample of grazing ground, because there will be a difference there in terms of the information you receive back. Um, Avoid, individ avoid unusual areas. So when you're out sampling, it's important that you, you don't take a sample there around gateways, feeders, old fences, ditches, dung and urine patches, because they will have an impact there in the P and K readings you, you, you get back. Just in terms in of the length of time after the last P, P and K applications, be it chemical, fertilizer, slurry applications, Ideally, you're looking for about three months there of a gap from when you last apply P and K to the soil to take in your sample. So really, December and January are two ideal months to, to carry out soil sampling. It's OK there to, to sample after in or you really or can. So there's no, no issue there. Ideally, then you'd, you'd leave about two years from the last lime recommend last lime application. So I suppose. As to follow on from Richie, I suppose this is definitely the first area we need to look at and show a bit of urgency there. If you don't already have samples on the farm, you know, contact your advisor in the next couple of weeks and put a plan in place of getting samples taken. Because ideally you want to have them back before the, the start of the slurry spreading season in, in January, February of, of 2022. So just in terms in all soil samples, you know, the, the three three or four main recommendations that you'll be looking out for when you receive your results back are the, the soil pH, the P index of the soil, the K index of the soil, and any lime recommendation for the, that given sample. So I suppose first off here, you'll see that the, the, the lime pH for the set of samples on the screen. Um, you'll see the P index, and it'll be ranked here one to four. So there's index, soil sample eight there has a pH of 6.8. 
it's a P index of four and it's a K index of four. So what that means is, I suppose, the, the soil index system, it's ranked one to four. If the soil is shown up as a number one, it means that it's low in that particular nutrient. If it's shown up as an index four, it's high. So I suppose with 2020 in mind, you know, if you, if you get results back in the next couple of weeks and you identify some of these plots that are showing up that have a high, have, have a few of these threes and fours, the likes of paddock eight here, it's shown up that it's high in P and K. This is the field that already has enough P and K in it. So it could be a parcel that you could, you know, leave off the slurry for next year and maybe use it elsewhere on some of the lower index fields. So the big value of the soil samples is, is, is it identifies these high fertility fields. And with next year, and Pat's going to cover the importance of slurry in the next section, it'll just allow you to make better use of the slurry you have on the farm. Because in most cases, you won't have enough slurry to, to cover the full farm. But if you can identify some of these fields that are high in P and K, you can admit them from, from, from slurry and P and K chemical fertilizer applications and use a straight nitrogen product on them. So I suppose the first thing is identify the high fertility fields for, for 2022. It gives you the option then of reducing and emitting P's and K's on, on these parcels. It allows you then to target your your farm your organic manure to your lower lower index fields and give priority to your silage ground, which is the biggest demand for P and K in the farm. And that, this offers a major potential savings to reduce the impact on on fertilizer prices for for twenty twenty two. So again, the the couple of samples I have up there, it's a farm map for phosphorus, farm map for K. It's easy there. It's color coded in terms of what index it is. So the lighter colors, the pink and the, the bluey color, give an indication of the lower lower index fields, as opposed to your threes and fours, your darker green color, identifying your higher index fields. So ideally in this situation, the farm would be avoiding maybe slurry and P and K applications to the heavier green, heavier colored fields, and maybe prioritizing them to the lighter colors on the on the, the farm map. But again, that's only possible by having a, a valid set and in date set of soil samples on the farm to, to allow you to do that. So the second step then is, is, is your soil pH and lime. And there's been a good bit of work done on this in Kilkenny. A lot of lime has been spread in the in the last couple of years, particularly with the lads in, in derogation. But just a, a just a refresher on it. So for grassland, your target soil pH is somewhere around 6.3 to 6.5. On a peachy soil, then it's 5.5 to 5.8. Really, lime recommendations and applicate really lime recommendations. Um, you know, you, you, you'll find them on your soil sample results, and any application needs to be based on what shows up on your from from your soil test. Your max application there will be roughly, I suppose, three ton to the acre in a single application. So if you have recommendations on your soil results showing up with more than three ton per acre, the best best practice is to go with three ton, no more than three ton, and come back in a couple of years' time there and and go with second application. You don't want to overline because I suppose you, you don't want to, you want to avoid trace element problems um, as a result of overlining. In terms of you know when is the best time to lime, this is a common question we get on a regular basis. You know, any time of the year is is okay to get lime out. If you're looking at silage ground, you're probably safe as best is directly after it's it's silage is being taken off it when the swart is nice and clean. But you definitely need to be a minimum of leaving a minimum of at least three months before it harvesting for silage. So we're the 15th or 14th or 15th of December today. You know your 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 op your your opportunity to get lime out in your silage ground is 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 limited now at this stage. You will have an opportunity in January and early February, but after that you need to be closing it up for 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 your silage being taken up in in mid May. Um. So just in in terms of the effect of soil improving the soil pH and lime advice. So this is probably some of the low lying fruit for next year. For, for fields that, you know, results come back that show that this soils are acidic there on, on farm. Um, so if you, you look at the soil, the more acidic the soil is, the less available the key nutrients are. So I, 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 I had up on the previous slide that the recommended pH is 6.3 to 6.5. 
if you look here at the, the 5.5 and if you follow it right down, you'll see how the nitrogen is much less available at a pH of 5.5, particularly the phosphorus there becomes really, you know, it's, it's, you're not, a lot of it's just been locked up in the soil and you're not getting much benefit from it. Same with your, your, your P and your, your, same with your K and your sulfur there. So again, ideally the, the recommendation is, is 6.3 to, to 6.5 and it'll give you, I suppose, it, 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 it'll give you a better, better response from, from applying a chemical and, and organic fertilizer on, on, on your, your soils. Just to, to move on then to, I suppose, to the to trial there that was done and completed in Johnstone Castle. Um, and it just looked at the effect of P and the, the interaction with, with improving soil pH and, and applying lime. So it was, this was trial was done seven or eight years ago down in Johnstone Castle. The, the four treatments included in the trial, there was, you'll see them there across the chart. Uh, basically, there was nothing done on, on control one. Uh, the second treatment was lime only applied. The third treatment was phosphorus only. And the fourth treatment was P and lime applied. So you'll see there that the message here that we're trying to get across is from just up, up improving. So this, this trial was done in soils that were very acidic and had a pH in, in, had a pH of around 5.5. .5. So by applying five tons per hectare, um, it improved the, the soil index from an index, a very low index one, up to a, a high index two. So that was just from applying lime only. So basically what it done there is, is the lime improved the pH and unlocked the phosphorus that had been locked up down through the years in that soil. So, it, you know, it, it improved the growing conditions of that soil by just applying the lime alone. You'll see over here then there was a P only treatment. So there was 100 kgs per hectare of phosphorus applied to the soil. And whilst it did improve the, the, the index from a low index one up to a high index three, the 100 kgs of phosphorus per hectare is, is kind of an extreme. On farmer level, it would possibly take you with nitrates regulations, possibly three or four years to, 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 to apply 100 kgs per hectare. But in terms of cost effectiveness, there was there's a high variation there. So in terms of the, the five tons of lime per hectare, it probably costs in the region of a give or take 120 euro in comparison there to the 100, 100 kgs of phosphorus, which probably costs at the minute at current prices in the region of 350 euro. So there's definitely, you know, if there is low, low pH soils that are acidic showing up on on, on soil samples that are going to be taken there in the next, or taken recently there, or, or in the next few weeks or early January, you know, this is an area, particularly with prices, fertilizer prices next year, this is an area that's really lads should be focusing in on. That's the low lying fruit in terms of chasing something for next year, improve the, 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 the city, acidity of these soils. And, you know, it just basically unlocks, unlocks pea that's already in the soil. Uh, just on the four treatment then, so that the, the combination of improving the soil pH, unlocking the, the phosphorus that was already in the, in, the, in the ground and applying the 100 kgs of phosphorus per hectare, you know, pushed it up into a high index four. But as I said, the 100 kgs per hectare is an extreme and at firmer level, you, you know, you wouldn't be doing that in, 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 in one application. So. To, just to follow up on, on, on the importance of alignment for our next year, I suppose, you know, that soil pH and improving soil pH through lime application, it increases grass growth production annually. It releases nitrogen. Um, so up to 80 kgs of nitrogen per hectare is released when you improve the soil pH and bring it up to optimum. So to put that in units per acre, that's... I suppose it's 68, works out roughly 68 units per acre. So current nitrogen prices and Pat's going to cover a bit in that in the next section. It's, you know, it's equivalent to just over two and a half bags a can. That's there. 
um, in, in the soil currently that you know is something that if you have acidic soils, it's that's potentially an area you could chase for for next spring. It improves soil P availability. So you've seen there from the previous slide, a low acidic soil by even applying five tons per hectare, it, it essentially moved it from a low index one up to a, a high index two. So, you know, there's, there's loads of P in these acidic soils that's, that's just locked up and, and maybe needs just the, the, a lime application to, to give it a, to, to unlock it and, and I suppose make it more available to, to grow grass. Um, it increases response into freshly applied in P and K. So this is particularly important again for next year that, you know, at, at the current prices that you're getting maximum efficiency from anything you're applying, be it organic manure, slurry or, or chemical fertilizer, you know, you really need to see value for money in anything you're applying next year. And your starting point is without doubt having your, your soil pH correct. Um, so as I said, to take every opportunity to apply lime um, and just clover is something that's been mentioned and we're not going to cover it too much in depth, but it is something that's been mentioned to, at some stage to, to, you know, it's going to have an impact there in terms of if these nitrogen prices stay the, the way they are, but clover swarts do like a high, higher pH as well. So, you know, you could set your swart up to potentially go after clover in, in, in the near future. But just to, to, to keep moving on, and I suppose Richie touched on this, it's, it's, this is, so, you know, these are areas we're going to have to look at pretty closely in the next couple of weeks and show urgency because we don't really have time to play with the fertilizer season is just, just behind the corner there. So we've, we've only really a few weeks. And the first step, as I said, is in the next few weeks, if you don't have samples in date on the farm, is get on to, to your local advisor get your samples taken ideally in December or early January. Um, and this will help you then target your, your slurry and lime applications for spring 2022. Um, I just see, see some of the names that are on the call there. You know, there, some of these lads do have nutrient management plans in place the last number of years. Now is no better time is for, for a special price next year. Get Review that nutrient management plan with your advisor identify areas of the farm that you can, you know, maybe admit P and K from for next year. Um, you know, that's where, where the low line fruit is. Identify these high fertility fields, leave off your slurry for, for next year and target the better use of your slurry on your silage fields and your lower index fields. Um, the second area then, as I said, is lime. You know, weather conditions have been fairly okay. You know, if ground conditions allow, I suppose now is a great opportunity on, on drier soils to, to continue putting out your bit of lime. Um, again, needs to be based on, on, on a recent soil sample. Um, avoid land, which will get slurry in the next two to three months. So ideally you'd go with your slurry first um, because I suppose going with lime and going with slurry straight after you're increasing the chances of, of, of in losses. Um, and again, apply lime at least three months in advance of silage making. So again, your window is quite small there. So again, it's 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 show urgency with your soil samples and, and your lime applications to, to, to set yourself up for, for fertilizer plan next spring. Slurry, I'm not gonna Pat's going to cover this in depth, but it's a great opportunity again. You know, it's we're going to have to start making better use of the slurry. And the first port call is for next when you're putting together a fertilizer plan is to, I suppose, calculate the volume of slurry that you will have available on the farm next spring. So it's fairly simple to get the dimensions of your tank and work out in your head. You know, if, if you're going to go with 1500 gallons per acre applications, how much potentially, how much ground can you cover next spring? And also look at maybe possibly getting the slurry tested. Um, again, it's going to be covered by Pat there. There's some interesting results there shown from, from some of that work that was completed in Kilkenny last year. Uh, use low emission slurry spreading technology to deliver high end to the swords. So it reduces your, your, your nitrogen loss. Uh, apply again in spring to reduce nitrogen loss. So this is areas most lads are, are aware of. Ideally front load your slurry to, to your spring and you know you're you're not going to have loss, um, um, you know, compared to, to going with it later on and, and and hot humid conditions in summertime, and again I suppose 
based on soil sample results, target your lower index paddocks with this slurry and give priority to your silage fields as it has the highest demand for P and K. Um, and again, just based in, so I suppose you have your, your lime, you have your samples taken, you have your, your pHs, um, you're looking to improve your pHs, you're, you're getting best use of your slurry. And your final tip then is just, you know, as I said, fertilizer price are high. Unfortunately, most most lads on the call can't do without fertilizer. So it's just getting a balance in place with your slurry and your lime applications um, to, to have a, a fertilizer plan in place and to try and limit the impact of these and increase fertilizer prices for next spring. And I think that's me finished on that one, Richie. Okay, and uh, that's great. Thanks very much. Very comprehensive. A lot of information there. So we'll deal with some of the questions later, but keep the questions coming into Q&A. And while Pat's uh, getting ready his presentation, just one question that came in there, and uh, it's about how long, there's a big emphasis on lime, it's the cheapest fertilizer, you, you, you emphasize that, but how long does it take lime to work? So if I put out lime today, how long will it take that to work? So I'm getting massive release of other nutrients, but how long will it take it to work? Um, so ground limestone, roughly 30% 30, 30 of it will work straight away. And the remaining particles will work over the course of two to three year period. So you are getting nearly an instant impact there from, from us. Okay. So again, keep the questions coming. And then there will be the, after Pat's uh, presentation, we'll have uh, more questions. So Pat, you're going to talk mainly about the uh, slurry application for next spring. Yes, Richie, thanks very much, folks. So uh, the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about the importance and the use of slurry as a fertilizer. And I think it's been said enough times already tonight, and we know it, but with where we are as regards fertilizer prices, <clears throat> capital slurry, you know, generated on your farms, it busts replace a proportion of chemical fertilizers in 2022. I suppose being honest, some farms would admit that they've, you know, haven't paid as much adherence to slurry over the years, and they still have applied the same chemical application rates regards of slurry application, but that must change for 2022. Just moving on here, if we can here. Try out. So I suppose the first point to make there again, as I said, is that slurry is a fertilizer and not a byproduct of farming. And with the increased uh, number of dairy herds in particular, but since 2015, there is a lot more slurry being generated on Irish dairy farms. But as we'll see later on, the quality is highly variable. And that's one thing that you need to look at. The quality has been very, very variable across farms. So I suppose you've posed the question, what is the fertilizer and monetary value of cattle slurry now? So I'm taking a 7% dry matter slurry, which would be good quality slurry, covered tank. And on average, that is the nutrient composition that you see there. Nine units of nitrogen per thousand gallons. Uh, it was spread by low emission slurry spreading, which we'll talk about later on. Five units of phosphorus and 35 units of potash. Now, that would be the average analysis of that slurry at 7% dry matter. And when we, when we apply the uh, current fertilizer prices to that slurry, that same 1,000 gallons of 7% dry matter, you can see there that the total value of that slurry on today's price is 46 euro per 1,000 gallons. And indeed, that can be higher if the dry matter is higher, and obviously lower if the dry matter is lower. But as you can see there, it is quite substantial. So your 1,000 gallons of slurry is one bag of 9,535, 150 kilo bag, and it's worth in today's money 46 euro. So if you look at a 100 cow herd that would produce 120,000 gallons of slurry over a 16-week period, that is the equivalent of generating six tons of 9,535. So that poses the question, what is in your tanks? So the table that I'm presenting here is a standard table from analysis from the laboratories over the years. And you can see the huge effect that dry matter here on the left. So the headings here are dry matter percentage in the first column. And then we have nitrogen, available nitrogen per thousand gallons, phosphorus and potash. So you can see the huge uh, effect that dry matter has. So your typical covered slatter tank would be in the six, 7% and higher dry matter terms. And your slurry lagoons, dairy washing tanks would be at the lower end of the table there, 2% dry matter, maybe even lower. So you can see there, as dry matter moves up and down, it has a huge effect on N, P, and K. So I suppose it poses the question, what is in your tanks? And how might you determine what's, what's in your tanks? It is a huge slurry value, as I said there already, for a 100 cow herd. That's before we even talk about the young stock. But the only way to answer it is to carry out slurry testing on your farm. 
and determine your own farm actual N, P and K. And I would throw it out to the audience tonight. It would be a very good project at individual level and maybe discussion group level to carry out now and have that information available for next spring. Never more than this year to get slurry analyzed. So how do you analyze slurry? There's two ways really. One is to send a sample to an approved laboratory. So our recommendation would be that you have the slurry agitated if you're going to spread it. Take a subsample from the rear of the tanker if possible, or else deposit some slurry into half a blue barrel on the ground. And then fill a two liter subsample plastic bottle with the slurry, you know, wash it, dry it, clearly label with your name, address, herd number, et cetera. And what I would say there, just in the interest of security, that it doesn't explode because there are, it does contain some gases, is to keep it in a cool, dry place before you dispatch it to the laboratory. So the analysis that I would ask uh, the laboratory to provide me would be, would be to look at the dry matter percentage and the total nutrients in per kilos per ton of N, P, and K. And from my experience uh, this spring with a group uh, that we took out, took, took some samples, that is going to cost you somewhere in the region of 75 euro to 100 per sample, which would go very little next spring in buying fertilizer. The other way is the use of a slurry hydrometer. This is a glass instrument. So you basically get a jug or a container of agitated slurry and you drop the slurry hydrometer into it. And the denser the slurry, the higher the dry matter, the less it will actually sink into the actual jug. And from that, if your eyesight is very good, you can see there, the cylinder there is graduated with the dry matter percentage. So you can read off the dry matter of the slurry from the hydrometer and then refer to the standard tables that I presented in the previous slide. So two ways to get slurry analyzed, laboratory analysis and or the use of a slurry hydrometer. Maybe a good project or maybe if you haven't written your letter to Santa Claus so far, maybe you might look for a slurry hydrometer for 2022. So following on from that, this year, myself and a number of advisors in the Kenny Water Chagas area, we carried out a slurry analysis project with a number of discussion groups, I think totaling 48 farms in total. So what did we find? So apologies, there's a lot of figures here. If you want to take a photograph of any slides, I'm sure you can along the way. But basically we, we analyzed, the, got the 48 samples analyzed and we have them divided in three based on whether they were covered slatter tanks uncovered tanks, stroke slurry lagoons, and dairy washing tanks. So for the covered slatter tanks, the average dry matter came back at 7.2%. And the range there from probably 3% up to 10%, depending on the amount of coverage of the tank and also the adequacy or, or the, you know, that there were very little extra water coming in from down pipes, uh, from yards, etc. So the average slurry came back at 7.2% dry matter, Available nitrogen, six units per thousand gallons, five units of phosphorus. And what surprised us was is that we found that the potash levels were higher than here to expected in the previous studies. And indeed, some of the potash levels were as high as 50 to 60 uh, units per 1,000 gallons. So that's the average analysis. And in today's money, again, putting on the current fertilizer prices, 48 euro per 1,000 gallons. There was a small number of farms had uncovered tanks and slurry lagoons. And again, as you can see here, much lower dry matter, 3%, with an average nitrogen of 3, P of 2, and 14 of K. So as we saw heretofore, dry matter has a huge effect on diluting, particularly the P and K value of slurries. And then there was a number of dairy washings tanks. They average 2% dry matter with average nitrogen of 2 units per 1,000 gallons two of P and 14 of K, not too dissimilar to the uncovered tanks and slurry lagoons. So as you can see, the huge message that we got from this study was that there's huge variation at farm level. We all maybe think about applying two to three or whatever it is, a thousand gallons of slurry per acre on silage ground or grazing ground. But as you can see, there are huge variation there in what you're applying in, in terms of P and K and indeed nitrogen. So the message is get your slurry analyzed and then see what you're dealing with. So in summary, what I'm saying about slurry applications, where should we target slurry applications? Well, obviously the first thing has, has already been alluded to by end of there is that we need to know where is the P and quarter the P and K levels and where is the P and K lowest. So we should target the slurry on the fields with the lowest P and K status. And on your NMP maps, they are the fields in the pink and the blue colors on that map there, which is shown on the screen. When? 
Well, we know that springtime is better than summer. We have less volatilization of ammonia gas. And in cool and damp conditions, we want to maximize the return per thousand gallons of slurry spread. In dry, warm weather, we get a lot of losses of gas, ammonia gas, particularly the atmosphere. But this has been greatly improved by the how, which is the use of low emission slurry spreading techniques. And a good number of you on the call tonight, I'm sure, have used the less application method for the last year or two, and you can see the huge benefit it brings to the environment and also to the farmer's pocket. And the rate obviously then would be determined by, you know, the what you're dealing with as regards the slurry dry matter and the inherent N, P and K value. So look, a lot there maybe in a short bit of time, but the key message is slurry is a valuable nutrient. Please get it, get it analyzed and have your results back for 2022. It is a fertilizer, which has a huge value. And we're saying on average 48 euro per 1000 gallons of slurry on your farm today. So unless there's anything else. Okay, Pat, go. that's that's brilliant. And I think um, Mark is going to set up a video there first. Thanks to Mark Trimble in the background looking after all the technology. He's going to set up a video. But before the video comes on, there's a few questions. Good few questions. Keep the questions coming in and the Q&A. Uh, Terry is with me here in the background. He, Terry will have a few questions there as well. But Pat, to you, first of all, slurry additives. Does it increase the nitrogen and its availability? Look, we have no independent research showing benefit and return for investment for some of these slurry additives. They are quite expensive. Uh, what they are proposed to do is to lower the pH of slurry and make the N, P and K more available. But I think for farmers, the starting point would be to look at, first of all, what is the dry matter content of the slurry? Is there a lot of downpipes and things they can do around the yard to reduce water ingress into tanks? and maybe get the slurry analyzed. And I have one client who is going to do a little trial for me this winter. He has bought some of these slurry additives and he's going to put the additive in one tank, no additive in the other tank, and he's going to get the two slurries analyzed in the early springtime. And then I'll be able to report with more confidence on the success or not of these additives. Okay, I think the research from Johnstown had no benefit. Uh, James, uh, I was spreading lime over the last two weeks on low cover paddocks. Um, they're the target paddocks for slurry mid-January. Is there any issue? So lime goes out today, they're going to get slurry uh, in mid-January. Any issue with that? So we're going to, look, we know that lime and slurry, they can, it can lead to some loss of ammonia gas from the slurry. But look, at this time of the year and in the springtime, I would say that that level is quite low. In the ideal world, you'd like to have the slurry out and go with the lime later. But at this time of the year, over the winter period, you have the lime out, which is very important to get greater availability of N, P and K in next spring, I wouldn't be that worried. But generally, we'd like to keep them apart at least seven to 10 days. Uh, but look, I would I would take it, think it's very little at this time of the year. Ammonia losses are quite low. Yeah, the there's, there's a question here. Comment more on the high K in the slurry samples. You mentioned in your presentation that there was slightly higher K. Did you might, and uh, in the results? Yeah, again, it was surprising to us all. Um, the higher dry matter, the higher the K value was. These were all agitated slurries. They were all from dairy farms. And obviously, it comes back to maybe the feeding, the, the, the level of feeding that's happening on, on, on those farms. But also, I would say that, um, you know, sometimes we are prone to maybe putting out slurry maybe, maybe a little too close to when we cut silage. And we have high potash silages as a result. And an increasing number of clients that I would deal with there would report to me that they're getting, they experience what we call subclinical milk fever. So really the message again on your silage would be now from an analysis point of view, get your silage analyzed and the silage level is over 1.8% in potash. You may be on the lookout for subclinical milk fever next spring and you may have to feed extra mineral so calcine magnesite to counteract it. So get the silage analyzed as well. But I think it's down to, the frequency of time or length of time between spreading the slurry and cutting the silage. But yes, but really cut back on the chemical K application. Okay, and uh, one final question for you, Pat, before, and then Terry might have a few for end, uh, is the difference between a trailing shoe and a dribble bar, I presume it's the difference in, the, in, in nitrogen um, in both by using. Yeah, from the research work done so far, there was a, a, a gain of three units per thousand gallons by using the trailing shoe over the dribble bar, along with the physical advantage of less soil, less grass contamination with the trailing shoe. 
over the dribble bar, but both methods are still superior to the splash plate of old. Okay, Terry, have you any questions there coming through? Uh, yeah, Richie, a few questions coming in there on the soils and the lime. Uh, maybe end, end it, just, sorry, just a few questions there. A couple of repeating themselves about maybe going to close up silage ground the end of March. How, how close does that kind of go at lime? Yeah, so really, you know, you'd want to leave it at least before harvesting minimum, you know, at least three months between applying your lime and harvesting your silage. So, you know, I suppose the ideal situation is really, you know, probably your window there is is, is January at this stage, early February, or, you know, alter, or alternatively leave it till after you have your silage taken up and get it out then on a clean sort. Yeah, and just another question here. If I've taken soil samples uh, three years ago, is it time to do them again, or when would I repeat? Look at what the fertilizer price is next year. Look, they're still in date. They're shelf life. But you've still another year or two on them. But, you know, with fertilizer price next year, might be no harm to, to, you know, value for money. You have a nice, clean set of samples, accurate to move forward with the early next spring. You know, this year, I think it's probably... Good recommendation, Terry. Yeah, it's a, it's a small spend, yeah. That's more or less it, Richie. I just see one there, maybe it's for Pat there, asking, comparing the hydrometer to sending off the Surrey sample. Yeah, yeah, the hydrometer gives you a dry matter reading there and then straight away, and then you're relating back to standard table that I presented, Terry. So, look, it, it does work, um, but I'm just saying to you, look, for the, for the cost of 75 euro to get and take a proper sample of Surrey, why not? It's very little compared to fertilizer price for next spring. Okay, Richie, back to okay, you. Okay, perfect. And just one last question that that came through there was: Should you test every tank, Pat? Well, I would say look. I would look at the tanks. If, if some tanks are, are prone to more water ingress than others, I would definitely would test uncovered tanks on a farm and cover tanks. Look, you can do it. Look for seventy-five euro per tank. If, you, if the two tanks in shed, well, one. Uh, one test per shed is surely enough. And obviously, then you might go and look at the dairy washing tank as well. So why not do two or three tests? Look at the sheds around the yard, the cattle fattening house, the dry cow house, and maybe the dairy washing tank and have that information going forward. Okay, perfect. So, Mark, you're going to put on the video there? Yeah, i just get it going here now. Okay, and thanks to John Berrigan, Mullivat, and Cahill Summers for this now is an ideal time to make a plan regarding next spring's fertilizer and slurry applications. There are three things you can do on your farm. Number one is soil sample your farm. This should be done three months from your last slurry or P and K fertilizer application. Number two is to spread lime in your farm, as this is the cheapest fertilizer available. And number three is to spread potash. This is cheaper than nit nitrogen and phosphorus. A fourth thing you can do on your farm is get your slurry tested. Earlier this year, a project was completed by 40 farmers in Kilkenny Warford region where they sampled their slurry. Farmers with covered slurry tanks came in at a value of 6 units of nitrogen, 5 units of phosphorus and 41 units of potash. This is a current value of 43 euro per thousand gallons. Farmers with lagoons, their slurry came in at 3 units of nitrogen, 2 units of phosphorus and 14 units of potash. This is a current value of 16 euro per thousand gallons. And farmers who sampled their dairy washings came in at a value of 2 units of nitrogen, 2 units of phosphorus and 14 units of potash on average. This is a current value of 15 euro per thousand gallons. The key findings from the project was that there was huge variations in the samples, particularly in potash, and also that potash came in much higher than we originally expected. Regarding planning for spring fertilizer and slurry applications, the aim should be to apply the right rate in the right paddocks with the right machine at the right time. First up, regarding the right rate with slurry, no more than 2,500 gallons should be spread per acre. Regarding fertilizer rates, the aim should be to have 60 units out by the 1st of April, and also it's very important to take the nitrogen from your slurry into account. Slurry should be aimed on low covers of grass. It also should be aimed on paddocks that are index 1 and 2 for P's and K's. Slurry should be spread by low emission techniques. This will give us plus 3 units of nitrogen next spring, and also will leave grass much cleaner and give us much more options regarding grazing. Slurry should also be targeted on silage fields at these at the highest P and K offtakes. Regarding chemical fertilizer, it should be targeted on fields that we will get a response on, such as dry fields and fields that haven't receded in recent years. Our fertilizer spreader must be calibrated over the winter and working correctly. It's very important to apply your slurry and chemical fertilizer when soil temperatures are increasing and are at six degrees Celsius. 
It's also very important to employ them when there's no heavy rain expected and ground conditions are, are trafficable. Okay, perfect. Thanks for that, Mark. Listen, Enda, you're going to go through now an actual practical example for a dry stock farmer at two different oh. stocking rates. Uh, what should he spread next spring? Yeah, perfect. It's Richie. Yeah, so I'm going to run through this quick enough because I suppose we're, we're getting, we're probably going to run over time a little bit, but John outlined a few key points that I'm, I won't get bogged down in terms of getting the right time and then right rate. That's particularly important in the cu first couple of months of the year. But the first example I'm going to look at is really just main maintenance rate for, so the example I have up, it's a dry stock situation. Firm is, is, is stocked at, about 130 kilos of organic nitrogen per hectare. So it's, it's quite a common stock and right, that we, we kind of see there. The soil P and K index is assumed to be an index three. Um, so just to, in terms of the N, P and K for the year, you're looking at about 90 units of, of nitrogen per, per acre to, to drive the, the system. Uh, and in terms of P and K, to maintain the P and K status of the soil at an index three, you're, you know, there's a low enough P and K demand on, on grazing ground. So this example is for grazing ground only. Pat's going to cover a bit in silage ground there. Um, so you're looking at essentially on a, on a farm stocked at 130 kilos of organic in per hectare, which is equivalent to 1.5 life units per hectare. You're looking at even one bag of, of 8 and 612 uh, should be enough there to, to maintain the, the P and K status of, the, of that soil. So just in terms of the windows, then I suppose you're you're going in there in March when as John outlined temperatures have improved a little bit with half a bag of protected urea, or alternatively, if, if you have spare slurry on the farm that you haven't prioritised to silage ground, you're going out there with about 15, 1,500 gallons of slurry in, as your first application. And this could potentially, if you have slurry available, could potentially replace your, your compound 18612 example there, fertilizer that I've used. Um, you're following up then with about 18 units in, 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 in April and 23 units in, in, in May, June period. But I suppose the, the key is that you're looking, you know, essentially equivalent to one bag of 18612 will maintain the, the P and K status. Um, P and K index on, on a farm stocked at 130 kgs of nitrogen per hectare. Moving on then just to a slightly more heavily stocked for, uh, example. Um, so it outlines again, it's, I've used protected tree as the main nitrogen source. The farm stocked at about 0 0.8 livestock units per acre, which is equivalent to so 180 kgs of organic nitrogen per hectare. So roughly two livestock units per hectare. So again, we assume that, you know, with the preferred fertilizer prices, you know, most situations, dry stock situations, they'd be looking just to put up, uh, apply a maintenance application of P and K. And in this situation, you'll see the maintenance rate there for on the grazing ground alone is eight units per acre of P and 12 units per acre of, of K. So as I said, the P and K demand is, is low on grazing ground. Um, so your first step, again, you're looking at slightly higher nitrogen application of 130 units per acre to drive this system. And again, as John outlined, you're looking for an opportunity maybe in weather condition and ground conditions allow in February and March. Uh, and you have the temperatures there that you'll, you could alternatively look to the, to replace one of these first applications of chemical fertilizer with an application of, of 15 gallons, uh, 1500 gallons of, of slurry. Just in terms of the example there, in terms of the P and K, that's on grazing ground, that's on grazing ground alone. So if you are taking out paddocks for, for bales or that, you need to possibly go out with an additional application of, of slurry or look at putting in a bit more of your your compound P and K fertilizer. So essentially by the end of June there, you'd have roughly about 90 plus units of nitrogen used and you'd you'd have your 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 soil fed with the, the P and K for the year in this April May bracket. Um but again it's you know in, in some situations you won't have the, the slurry on the, the farm to you, you will have to go with your compound fertilizer. But as I said if an opportunity arises 
you try and get some of that slurry out into that February March period. And that's all I have, Richie, on that. Okay, Pat and uh, Paul are going to come in there, Paul, out in Nordingford. And I think Paul has a lot of good techniques of what, you know, tools he's going to use uh, for next spring. Uh, so Pat and Paul will hand over to you. Okay, so I suppose I'm going to present again just three slides there looking at example or sample fertilizer plants for dairy farmers for 2022. I suppose just to make the point that the grass out there doesn't know what the price of nitrogen is, so it still needs nitrogen and still has to grow enough grass for grazing and for your first cut silage next year. So the first scenario here, I'm just presenting again, taking a farm, typical dairy farm, maybe stocked at one lysoc unit per acre or 210 kilos of organic nitrogen per hectare over the year. But this is looking at a farm where it's index one, very low for P and K, or part of the farm that may be low for P and K. And again, the value of your silo results and your NMP color maps. So what is the requirement for that field for the year to grow enough grass? It's 30 units of P and 75 units of K. This now is for grazing ground. So I'm only presenting the fertilizer plan for the first part of the year uh, because there's no point in talking too far through the year. So really, again, as you can see there, to get early grass growing, we're looking at using a half of a 50 kilo bag of ideally protected urea in the February period. And we'll come back to that maybe later in the Q&A on looking at conditions, et cetera. That's just get early grass. And that could be also replaced by the two to two and a half thousand gallons, sorry, instead of the half bag of protected urea. In order to get the P and K out then, 1812, I believe, is the product of choice with or without sulfur. It's a two to one relationship between P and K. And from a climate change point of view, it has been shown to have lower emissions than can or the high end compounds, the cut sword or pass sword of this world. So it's well balanced. And the recommendation I see in the table there would be two bags of 8612. The yes there is for sulfur or not in March and skip a month and two more bags in May. So as you can see there from the table, that has supply there. 24 units of P, which is practically all the P required from the 30. And from a K point of view, we only always recommend applying maintenance levels of potash in the springtime to reduce the risk of grass tetany. So while we are a bit short there from the K point of view, that our advice would also pick that up in the back end of the year, or maybe this time of the year, by using newer to potash to get out a bit more K. So that's the, they're the units across the way. So we're saying here that we can potentially use 130 units of nitrogen or have that used up to the 1st of July, of June. And as I'm put in there now, this slurry can replace either the half bag of protected urea or one and a half to two bags of A612, depending on the quality of the slurry from your analysis that maybe you will carry out following tonight's chat. So that's just a sample example program, trying to keep things simple, two splits of A612 and to use then protected urea as your fertilizer of choice for, for nitrogen. Uh, and then really, I suppose, after May, into from May onwards, I suppose we'll talk maybe potentially about using one unit of nitrogen per day of rotation. So that's scenario one, just look at it in broad summary there. So scenario two then is a farm where it's index three for P and K at the same stocking rate. So again, the table looks, you could say quite similar, but again, here really, we're just using one split of 18612 in the March period. Again, you might say, why aren't we putting out the 18612 in February? Well, you know, the protected urea or indeed ordinary urea is less leachable, especially in the early springtime of the year, where the 18612 is more leachable. So that's why it's always recommended to apply it in March and, and maybe if you need to follow up there in May. So the program here is quite simple in that the one split of 18612 it, 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 it has contributed the full P and practically the full K in one split. And that makes the fertilizer program very simple for the rest of the year. And I think we, everyone on the call tonight, we are looking for simple fertilizer programs each year, not to have too many compounds in, 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 in the yard. And again, you know, that 8612 or the, the, the bags, the, the slurry can replace the half bag of protected urea or the 8612 to cut down on costs. So that's what the figure in blue there is. That's allowing for the, the nitrogen in the slurry. Again, this is for a farm stocked at one livestock unit per acre overall, much higher stock rates than Enda would imagine for corresponding dry stock farms. And the same thing applies there as regards using the slurry in the springtime. And 
using, using potash then late season if we need it. But in this scenario here, two bags of A612 and our good quality story, if you have enough stories to go around, can make the fertilizer program very simple for next year. And maybe next year is a year for just maintenance levels of P and K going out and using slurry to provide that maintenance requirement. The last slide here I'm going to present here, I suppose that's going to happen in springtime, is fertilizing for first coast silage in 2022, where a lot of money each year is spent on fertilizer. So what are the requirements for fertilizer for the first coast of silage? So that's what they are. 100 units of nitrogen per acre from all sources. 16 units of phosphorus and 100 units of potash. That's what the crop actually removes for a typical first cut silage yield of 10 ton of fresh, of, of settled silage per acre. So if we come along then and we have kept the slurry and obviously slurry is valuable, more valuable for silage ground than grazing ground. And we apply it using the less technology that's out there. Three nines, we can get 27 units of nitrogen from that slurry. We can get practically all the P requirement from the slurry and practically all the K based on good quality slurry. So what does that leave with? That leaves with a balance of 73 units of nitrogen of chemical nitrogen in this scenario here that I'm presenting. And I just put up one example, fertilizer size can be one and a half, 1.6 small bags or 50 kilo bags of protected year per, per acre. So look, there, I believe there is huge scope to reduce chemical nitrogen rates on first cut silage. I would remark that most years people are ringing in March and April looking for recommendations for the first cut silage. And come the second week of May, third week of May, they're back in here in the Chagas office nationwide and other crop yards looking to test the nitrates and when are the nitrates low enough to cut silage. So that tells me that there is a bit of surplus nitrogen in the equation. And we have to have faith that the nitrate is in the slurry being applied by low emission slurry spreading technology. So that's, I suppose, a, a kind of a very simple thing. And I suppose the last point I've made there is that this will eliminate the risk of high nitrates and silage with interviews of preservation. And also if we over apply potash, as I mentioned earlier, we can induce subclinical mill fever in your dairy cows next spring. So look, that example there, we can fertilize a good crop of first cut silage with 3000 gallons of good cattle slurry and 1.6 bags of protected urea per acre. And keep it very simple and cut down on the cost of first cut silage in 2022. And that's all I have to say on, on fertilizer. So uh, before we, before we go to yep. Paul, just just uh, just a question came in here. So Pat, you're you're moving from January spreading to February spreading. That's the question. You don't start spreading nitrogen until February. Well, I think look, things have moved on. We have to look at the weather forecast at the time. I would think that the first thing to look at in the springtime would be the slurry before the, the chemical fertilizer. Uh, hopefully, again, that you have enough storage that we're not forced to go out on the 12th or the 13th of January exactly, because, you know, if if there's a lot of fertilizer in the story, which there is, we want it to be getting the same chance that chemical fertilizer would get. So, yes, the weather, I can't dictate what it's going to be, but it is going to be looking towards late January into early February, depending on soil temperatures and the weather, uh, weather ahead. And obviously, some farms are forced to go, sorry on the 13th or 12th of January. And obviously the main, like, you know, if there's no growth, where is that story going to go and where's the value of it going to be? So yes, we are moving to late January into early February period for the first application. Okay. And just the last slide there, Rich, is for the hand over to Paul there, was just people ring us every time about the cost and the look at the different fertilizers. So this is just a, a table here from a local cost that I received there showing ordinary urea there at 900, 890 euro per tonne, protect urea at 945, and can at 27.5% nitrogen at 685. But the important calculations do is, how much is it per cost, cost per unit of nitrogen? So as you can see there, the uh, protected urea and the ordinary urea are 25, 20 to 25 cent less per unit than can, and also we know that urea, protected urea, is much better for the environment with less ammonia and nitrogen losses. So that's just a little table there. Look at the cost per unit, not the cost per tonne. Excellent. And I suppose that just reminds about the risks that happen in the spring and autumn period. So over to you, Paul. Maybe just you're going to give us an outline the farm first and a few of the techniques that you will practice that you put in place. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm part of a partnership uh, near Urban with my parents and about 66 hectares and stocked about a count of the acre. 
Uh, milked 132 cows there this year and got over the 500 kilos of solids to eat anyway. Uh, so look, there's nothing there's nothing crazy about what we're doing. Simple system. Um, cheap and easy milk from grass really is, is a lot of it. We're not overdoing it on the fertilizer as it is. Um, I suppose in hindsight, maybe we should have been uh, spreading a bit more of it while it was cheaper. But anyway, um, hindsight is a great thing. Um, the next slide then, Pat, if you don't mind, please. So basically the summary of the soil fertility on the farm, um, the just looking from the nutrient management planner, um, the key thing from that page, I suppose, is the fact that there's 62% of the farm that's uh, ticking all the boxes, all the boxes kind of hitting the sweet spot, sweet spot there for um, the line P and K. Um, so it's um, it's mainly maintenance now. So hopefully sometime we'll get to closer to all maintenance, but um, uh, compared with the national average, we can be fairly happy with that. Um, so just in terms of the lime requirements on the farm or in the limestone area, so uh, quite a dry farm would burn up in the summer uh, in periods of, long periods of dry weather. Uh, so it'd be a fairly minimal lime requirement on the farm. Uh, we spread all the, the required lime there in November 2020, and uh, so it was at small enough rates of a ton to a ton and a half uh, per acre. So um, nothing wild um, needed on our farm. So the maps, then I suppose the big thing about the maps is the fact that uh, there's no way that I'm going to go through an envelope uh, of pages of different soil samples and all uh, all these uh, small numbers. Uh, parts per kilogram and all that um so look the maps are a visual thing for me i'm i wouldn't have the head to take it all in from the soil sample of course but all you need really is the three sets of maps your ph your p and your k and it's very easy to identify just at a glance then um what's doing well what isn't and where you should go where you, where you should target your slurry or your dung and um, it's very it's a very quick and easy way to make a decision and see uh, see where it would uh, be suited best to go with your organic fertilizer, or if you did have an allowance for PRK, where you should be going with that. Um, so the big thing about the map stand is no point in print, in no point in printing them off and leaving them in a drawer either. Um, so I just have them stuck up there, and like I said, it's just at a glance. If you're scratching your head, it's all fine. Saying to yourself, yeah, I'm fairly sure those couple of paddocks there in that area of the farm. Uh, I'm fairly sure they're low in K. We'll probably will give them an extra bit of this or that. Um, but it's very it's very easy. Just stick your head inside the door, have a quick glance at them, and you can make a decision on the spot whether it's dairy washings, slurry, or whatever. Um, you can just just have a quick look, and you can make a quick decision and um, very easily. Um, so basically, then plans for twenty twenty two. Uh, planned and soil sampling for a start. Uh, we soil sampled there two years ago, and I had intended at the time that we're going to kick off on a two year program more so than a four, just to keep the finger on pulse a bit better. Um, so, planning and organizing those soil samples now in the coming days. Uh, for slurry in particular, I just have there on the right the slurry spread and calibration tool. Uh, it's a very easy piece of kit to use. It's on the Shagas website as far as I know. Um, we invested in a new um, new tanker this year, so I just uh, did my couple of sums so you can very quickly get your few figures there, get your couple of gears that you know that whatever gear is 2,000 gallons the acre, whatever is 2.5, whatever is uh, 3,000 gallons. So I know, look at you, will get to know it and say, okay, there's a four acre paddock and I'm after going out with four uh, tanker loads of slurry and you can, you can go with that. But uh, it's just um, it's just a quick and easy way to get uh, an idea of where you're going anyway uh, before you go out. So in terms of the other slurry in general, though, utilising the low emission equipment, you're going to gain an extra three units of nitrogen over um, over a splash plate for every thousand gallons. And then if you spread the majority of your slurry in the spring, there's another extra three units of nitrogen. So you're after gaining six units of nitrogen for every thousand gallons of slurry. So if you're typically spreading 12, um, 2,000 gallons to the acre, you're after gaining 12 units of nitrogen for every acre you're spreading on. So I think that's something that we can't be ignoring. Um, if that was in uh, those 12 units of nitrogen per acre were in the back of the spreader and you spilt it, you'd, uh, you'd be regretting it anyway. So um, 
But then, look, there's a couple of different, there's a couple of different uh, tanks and all of that on our farm, between indoor, outdoor, ones that have pasture scraping on them, uh, ones where we're fatting dry cows, things like that. So we have a fair idea what where there's going to be uh, richer slurry and all of those kind of things. So we will be targeting those towards the uh, lower index paddocks. Um, generally, we would try to, to uh, thin down most of our slurry as best we can. The dairy washings has to be spread anyway, so you may as well um, pump it around to the different tanks and make the slurry a bit more um, available to the plant. And uh, I suppose any chance you get to avoid um, having a blockage in a macerator at the back of your tanker is definitely going to be a bonus too. I don't think anyone wants to face into that. Uh, so look, all the slurry will replace some chemical in. Up to now, we probably would have spread it and not taken into consideration the amount of chemical in end that was in the tanker, but uh, we definitely will be making more allowances uh, for in the future. Um, in terms of the chemical nitrogen, then I just have a picture there, a screenshot of the app that I use for just calibrating the spreader or just getting the, the settings. Um, I suppose really there's a, there's two parts to spreading fertilizer or slurry, really you could say there's someone doing the sums in the seat of the office and somebody pulling the levers in the seat of the tractor and uh, uh, I'd say sometimes there's a, a bit of a breakdown in communication between the two and sometimes you have to do something to see to the tractor too but and make adjustments but um, it's it's good to get an idea of it anyway. Uh, for 22 in terms of the chemical end though we will be using protected urea mainly um, we nearly all urea based uh, fertilizer this year um, P and K look it's we haven't got much of an allowance for P uh, there is there is a bit there and there are some paddocks that are low in K, so we will be spreading a bit of that, but mainly it'll be just for receding. Um, we will be reducing our chemical nitrogen usage here just in, term, uh, in terms of allowing for the full value of nitrogen in the slurry. Um, receding is probably somewhere that we have lagged behind a small little bit uh, in the past, not pushing on in terms of um, doing as much as we should on a year, yearly basis, but uh, definitely will be pressing ahead with that. I have noticed over the past few years that your uh, reseeds, and I think everyone knows it, that your reseeds definitely respond far better to your nitrogen, whatever form it's in. And even with droughts that we've had in the past couple of years, I have the biggest um, difference I've seen is that the receded paddock, paddocks that have been receded recently have definitely lasted better into the drought and recovered faster after the drought as well. Um, just in terms of actually spreading it, then probably more conscious of areas of the paddocks where the fertilizer will be wasted. Uh, as then the mentioned there, the unusual areas you could say with around water shocks, um, gaps, and things like that, or even areas where cows might be gathering or that as well. Um, but I suppose use of the the calibration app then is very convenient. You know, you can put in your fertilizer type, um, your speed, whatever, and it's and it gives you your setting. Most fertilizer, um, most spreader manufacturers, as far as I know, have some sort of app. Um, so I think they're just there to be used anyway. Um, but yeah, look, that's that's really it. There's nothing there's nothing mad about what we do at all. Um, just putting a bit of a plan in place, uh, getting the soil samples and making use of them. Uh, we did analyze our story there in the spring and we um, that was a bit of an eye opener then as well. Uh, just in terms of the different string they covered in an uncovered tank, there was about a percentage dry matter in a different string or two. Um, the P and K maps are essential for me, really. They're visual, they're very easy to read and all that. And then in terms of the apps, then making use of them for um changing settings and all that kind of thing. It's just it's just making life easy, I suppose. Um, but definitely uh, with the use of the training tune now as well, more so going forward, we'll be allowing much more for um our reduction in the chemical fertilizer use. Okay, great stuff, Paul. That's great. And, and the first question that comes uh, straight away was here, like you, 62%. We'll have to give Dennis credit for getting the 62% right, or are you taking the credit for that? Uh, 62% optimum for P and K and, and Lyme. That, that's like, I think the, the average is less than 20% so for nationally. So how did you get to that level? Uh, it, it was actually full enough a lot of the things that I've said that we're going to stay doing. So I suppose uh, why change a winning team, really? Um, we had colour-coded maps before. They weren't exactly... They look very different to the ones that are on the, on the slideshow there. Um, but, you know, it's 
it's easy to read information. The information is there. Um, you know, you, you're after doing, you're after going to the trouble of doing your science samples. I suppose up, uh, up to a while ago, maybe a lot of people, you're just doing your soil samples um, because you had to. But uh, no, you're you're paying you're paying a little bit of money for it. now. Look at the value is there if in your soil samples. But uh, you know, there's no point in getting this information without using it. Uh, that's my that's my thinking anyway. It's definitely uh, targeting um, targeting the areas that are that are missing whatever they're missing, um, and you know not to forget about the value, uh, but the P and K value in both your slurry and your dung. But uh, okay. there has to be animal to chemical to sort it out too. And there's a question coming in here: like your stock to the cow per acre, or two and a half livestock units per hectare. You used 170 kilos of nitrogen uh, per hectare, which is actually low at at a cow per acre. As much of the farm reseeded, what percentage? Maybe you said that, but what percentage of the farm is reseeded? There was short of 10% in the past year. Um, we definitely want to be staying up on top of that 10% going forward. Um, but look, uh, I suppose I, I'm 28 and there's, uh, there are paddocks on the farm that uh, I don't remember seeing sprayed off um, for reseeding. But, okay, but, but the nitrogen... Should... Look, look at pasture base and they're, they're not too far behind um some of the others so that's what i'm going off like look we grew about 12 tons there um this year but it's on production that we're picking out the receding you're picking out the the lower ones but yeah the palatability i'd say is definitely has definitely improved with the newer grasses as well though. okay and your plan then you know the price of fertilizer everybody is looking at you know the scarcity in the price your plan for fer- have you forward bought have you fertilizer bought uh, yeah, we we bought six tons there of urea um, in the past week. Um, so look, I don't know. These things rarely come down as fast as they go up. Um, so it's just you don't have to do. It's not an all or nothing kind of a thing. We're not buying all the fertilizer for a year. That'll cover us for maybe uh, nearly two rounds of fertilizer in the spring. Um, so it's just peace of mind, I suppose, and splitting our risk um, is the reality of it, really. Okay, so you have some there just. You want to spread it out yeah. during the year. Okay. And a question coming through there about multi-species, you know, in your reseeding policy, will you add in multi-species into that? Uh, definitely something we will consider. Um, we'll dip our toe in the water, if not the coming year or the year after. Um, I did see it on a research farm up in Mead, and I was very impressed with the um, soil structure and the health of the animals from it there as well. So there's, I think there's more than just the nitrogen fixing part of it um, that it, it requires credit for as well. And just with that then is the clover. Is there much have you much clover on the farm as it stands? And what's uh, your plan? Out, and what is your plan when, for clover? When I was out there doing the closing farm cover, I actually was very surprised by the amount of clover that's still out there. Um I suppose quite a mild winter so far. Um going forward, yeah, I do intend over sowing clover, uh, mixing it with the slurry hopefully uh, a bit in the coming year. Uh, an organic farmer friend of mine told me that uh, the best results from that are in April and May, if you're spending in April or May. So, look, it's a gamble. It's a small gamble. Right? It's, it's small gamble. Like, you know, a bag or two of clover. Uh, I know look, it's a couple of hundred euro, but in the bigger scheme of things, it's a small gamble to, uh, small thing to play with. Okay, so you will be trying it out. Yeah, and just a question coming through just for you, Paul, is... If you're taking bales off uh, excess paddocks, uh, do you target what do you target them with after that? Sure, look, the rule of thumb, the rule of thumb, I suppose, is about a thousand gallons for every four bales per acre. Um, at that stage in the year when you're taking off, I, well, I hope for a start, there was, there was going to be surplus bales next year. Um, but oh, uh, at that stage of the year, is mainly dairy washes that's going to be on the farm. Um, you will be spreading the majority of your slurry in the spring. So, and any slurry that is left, we will probably be pumping the dairy washings into that tank and thinning it down fairly well. But yeah, look, it's 2,000 gallons per acre of very thin slurry um, with a drain shoe and then follow on with your normal rate of um, nitrogen or maybe slightly reduced rate of nitrogen, I suppose, um, okay. allowing for the slurry. Okay. I think, I think just, just to summarise, Paul, what you said is you, you make a plan, use all the tools available and keep it simple. Yep, pretty much. That's it. Okay, well, I bring back Terry. If you have any other questions, we're gone past time. So, just any quick just questions two, there, Terry? Two quick questions there. If you want, Richie, one 
maybe to end our pat. Uh, when is the department going around to take soil test efforts for anyone that applied and were successful to, to they were chosen by the department? And the second question, probably to Paul, uh, protected urea, does it spread like normal urea or 18612? And what size are the bags? Testing well, from the soil sampling program, we do not know, but a lot of people have been approved for the soil sampling program. So we assume that they will be contacted by the approved soil samplers very soon. Um, it's it's again being run by uh, a different agency uh, outside of Chagas, and that's the department uh, have just issued approvals in the last couple of days as regards those who are successful in the scheme. Whereas we're continuing our soil sampling as normal here for the irrigation purpose through the Chagas office in Kilkenny and Waterford. Okay. Maybe another question on protected tree to Paul. Uh, yeah, from our experience, it's um, it spreads much the same to normal urea. I suppose to be fair, uh, Des spreads most of the fertilizer uh, on the farm here. Um, I just uh, tell them the settings and where to go. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's very much the same. But to be fair as well to the Vicon app that I used, uh, there's literally an option there for every compound and every fertilizer that I've ever come across. So it's a uh, it allows for that, uh, whether it's proved or unrelated, um, and it generally flows somewhere similar to urea. And are the bags 375 kilo or 500 kilo, Paul? Uh, 375. Yeah, I don't think there's any small bags available for people. To, the, the 50 kilo bags aren't in that, uh, in protected tree at this stage. Yeah, don't that's all so. I have, Richie. Okay, just just two questions on the protected urea. Just to kill this one is 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 the shelf life of protected. If I buy protected urea today, or if, if it's in the co-op today, how long does it last, Pat? What's the shelf well, life? Well, look, we would say oh, ideally it should be stayed on the bag, and you need to check at the time of purchase. But in, in general terms, six to nine months. And so what we didn't mention there too, the other advantage of the protected urea is that we do not have to worry about any interactions with lime or slurry because the the, we're not going to have the ammonia losses. So that's one good thing about protected urea. We don't have to worry about the interval between spreading lime or, and our story and protected urea, another advantage of using protected urea in 2022. Okay, great stuff, lads. Thanks very much to all the speakers. And uh, Pat, and particularly to Paul, we get paid for this. Paul, for coming in and, and, and yeah, taking the time out. Thanks very much. And and uh, it's coming short later. And for uh, taking all the questions and for coming on, fair play to you. Uh, you learned a lot from your father, anyway. Yeah, yeah. I'm okay, sure he's night. watching in there now, so uh, I'm sure he'll uh, he'll remind me of that. Okay, fair play. Uh, thanks to everybody for coming on to the call. Uh, re with a good crowd, lots of questions. If you've any further questions, you can contact the Chagas office at Dungarvan, Mullinavat, or Kilkenny. And at that, that we'll, we'll call it to a close. Wish everybody a happy Christmas and a prosperous new year and uh, hoping for a good one and stay safe. Thank you.